1962, General Motors was on top of the automotive world with half of all new cars sold that year coming from one of the five GM divisions. It was a short 20 years later that GM found themselves out of sync and out of touch with the buyers. And it wasn't just GM, it was Ford and Chrysler too. So much so that President Ronald Reagan got involved and he imposed an import quota, limiting the total number of imports coming into the United States at 1.68 million cars. But it wasn't all imports. The quota was limited to Japanese imports only. And it wasn't until 1988 that GM felt they had turned the corner with the introduction of their new intermediate size W body cars, which included the Buick Regal, the Pontiac Grand Prix, eventually the Chevy Lumina, and this, the 1988 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. When these cars first came out, for me, it was love at first sight. From the floating roof line to the wraparound rear glass, the two-tone body cladding, the big 15-inch wheels. Oh my goodness, I was in high school and I could not get enough of these things. This car I found on Facebook Marketplace. It was about a year, almost a year and a half ago now, and it's been a slow progression for me to get this thing back on the road again. When Oldsmobile introduced the International Series, they were really trying to compete more with the Europeans instead of the Japanese. They gave these cars four-wheel disc brakes, four-wheel independent suspension, it weighed 3,130 pounds. It has a 16 gallon gas tank. It has the FE3 sports suspension, which gives you a quicker ratio, tighter suspension, 15 inch wheels, tire upgrade as well. The International Series also comes with this super cool International Series badge. And there's, there's a few of these scattered around the car. You'll see different countries on flags on here. Uh, one flag that's missing, Japan. Yeah, it's kind of like a wink and a nod to Ronald Reagan. You get the 15 inch lace wheels and these are upgraded size 215 65 15 is stock i upgraded one size on this these are 225 60s you have another international badge right here you have classic w body door handles right here on the pillar and when you open this up this is the interior i was talking about bucket seats for the driver and passenger bucket seats for the rear seat passengers along with a center armrest and a cubby between the two seats this material I think it's tweed. That thing is so classic 1980s. Center armrest, floor shifter, leather wrapped steering wheel, another international badge. And this car is pretty loaded up. Power windows, power locks, power mirrors. The classic. <laughs> and this monstrosity. Oh my goodness, that thing's a mess. Inside, it is very comfortable place to be. You have your standard seat controls down here for your power seats forward, up, down, left, right, and tilt and recline. But you also have additional seat controls in the center console and you can switch between the driver and the passenger as well. Above the floor shifter, you have a cubby in here. Above that is an ashtray. HVAC controls with air conditioning as an option. Above that is the stereo system and the stereo up high like this, close to the windshield, is an indicator of the new GM. GM's new way of thinking where the most used optional accessory in a car being the stereo is up higher so you have less chance of taking your eyes off the road. You have HVAC vents over here. You have a crazy light switch. It's a two button light switch, which makes it kind of difficult just to get the running lights on. Cruise control, tilt wheel, on the leather wrapped steering wheel, no airbag here. On the passenger side, you have a pop-up glove compartment. And once you pull out the owner's manual, there's a second bin under here with more paperwork, storage, and room for things. And of course, you do get two cup holders. Map pockets on the doors. Out back, you get pockets in the rear of the seat. You get two fairly comfortable bucket seats. If you flip open the center console, yeah, there is storage and cup holders. And above that, a little storage cubby up here as well. Speakers in the rear package tray. It's more carpeting too. It's surprising how much carpeting is on this car. All the way up the doors, it's just strange. You get some additional lighting and you only get lap belts in the back in 1988. I'm surprised by that. Something else I'm surprised by? The headliner's still attached. Usually these things are dropping and drooping and making a mess. Down below the dash, you have a trunk popper right here. On the floor where you would think the trunk popper would be, it actually pops the hood. And a tug of the hood 
reveals the 2.8 liter V6 making 130 horsepower, 170 foot-pounds of torque. The compression ratio is, is fairly modest at 8.5 to 1. And the final gear ratio on this is 3.33 to 1, made it to a four-speed automatic transmission. All right, back inside with the door closed, you get this huge baby key. It's very strange looking, very cool though. You put it in and you are greeted to one of the coolest dashboards put into any GM product of the era. The exhaust, that's what you get with the International Series. You get that sport tuned exhaust. You get the coolest digital gauges. Ironically, I just turned 44,000 miles. I wasn't planned that way. Uh, I set the trip when I first bought the car and 578 miles in that year, year and a half or so that I bought it. Now this is a seriously cool car and I'm digging all of this, every piece of it, the touch, the sound, the smell of it. But I'm gonna tell you right now, there is some serious ergonomic issues. For instance, with the shifter in park, if you put anything into this cubby, it slides way down deep in there. You've got your whole hand, you gotta get in there. You gotta maneuver around the shifter. You have to dig your item out. While you're doing that, your arm and your wrist is scraping against the sharp edges inside this cubby and you ended up getting cut up a little bit. And over on the driver's side, the air conditioning and heating vents right here, you can see it's perfectly placed to keep the turn signal stock and the tilt wheel stock nice and warm and toasty in the wintertime. I like to have my hands uh, right here with the air vent blowing on them in the wintertime, trying to keep them a little warmer. Uh, this vent does none of that. It, it serves literally no purpose at all. The power window controls over here and the power door locks, you cannot easily get to them. What I find I'm doing is when I'm in a proper driving position, I have to use my pinky to put them up and down in the lock and unlock the doors. I guess in a perfect world, all this will be moved up. The power mirror controls would be put down and make things a little easier, but it's clumsy and difficult way of, of managing the power features right here. And then and it's this stupid seatbelt that's attached to the door. Generally, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. However, the other day I was picking up takeout. I was in this car. I opened the door, pulled the seat forward so they could drop the bag in the back. But this seatbelt was in a situation that she couldn't get in. I couldn't get out. I was trapped. It was just awkward and unwieldy and it was just, it was a disaster. I will say, however, with that seatbelt on the door, it's super easy to get a hold of. Typically, I'm reaching back to grab the seatbelt like this. With this car, it's not. It's simply right here at waist level. You just grab it, pull it over, and click it in. It's probably the most easy, efficient process of buckling a seatbelt I've ever seen. And now, with the trunk popped, key out, take a look in the back. You have a surprisingly large trunk for being a, a small car. Uh, flat floor. This is the luggage rack that I've taken off since I've been trying to clean up the exterior. You have some floor mats that came with the car, serpentines. You have a power antenna. Or on the trunk lid, you have the different code options and uh, features that are applied to the car. And on the trunk lid, you can see another one of those international badges. And you see that hazing and the fading all around the perimeter of that badge. That's what the entire car looked like when I first got it. It's as if the whole thing's been rubbed down with cardboard and left out in the sun for years and decades even. Although the clear coat's just fine on this thing. Now, even though it was so worn out, I, when I first looked at this car, I thought I could bring it back. And, and I've done a very good job so far, but there's still a lot more to go. Right here on all the corners, on all the edges, I just haven't been able to get all the way through it yet. And I think I'm gonna have to do a third layer of compounding and I'm trying to be delicate. I'm not trying to cut through the clear and get into the color, but all the detail work and the compounding and all the micro scratches, it all needs to come out before I'm satisfied with this. Now you can also see the mirror is kind of mangled here, bent out of the, the housing and it's all floppy. And over here on the hood, this is something that just recently started happening. It's just peeling it, and it's not just right there. I've got a bunch of little spots all over the hood. And so because of all these chips, and I'm not seeing it anywhere else in the car, I think it's going to be prudent just to pull the hood off and send it out and get repainted. Now, I paid $1,200 for this car, which isn't a whole lot of money, but in some ways I think I may have overpaid for this car. It's not just the paint peeling in the mirror and the paint quality on this thing. That was the problem. The real issue with this car and why I got it for so little money is the engine. The engine was bad. It had a terrible knock in it.
And the dude I bought it from, he was a real shyster. He was trying to hide the fact that the bearings on this thing went bad. And end result is the, the head gasket went bad. Coolant leaked out of the cooling system into the crankcase, burned up the bearings. Uh, there was no coolant in the system. The, the crankcase was filled with gear oil. The guy was doing everything he could to hide the fact that the, the engine was a mess. I knew that going into it. I still bought the car anyway. I thought the paint could be brought back and it's coming back. The interior was gorgeous. The miles were low. Everything made sense to, to put the effort and the money and the time into getting this thing back on the road again. So all in right now, even though I bought the car for 1200 bucks, I'm somewhere around six grand in it total between the engine replacement, AC, tires, brakes, and everything else that you need to do for a car that's been sitting since 2014. All right, enough of all that. Let's go for a ride. Tell you what getting this car to this point where it's driving and it's presentable has been a lesson in perseverance the body work the paint it just took a countless number of hours and processes to get it looking half decent and it's close but it's not there the engine i didn't know what i wanted to do with the engine at first i started looking for good use 2.8 liters and gm must have made millions of these engines but finding one today that's not worn out or beat up isn't so easy I went to junkyards, I started looking at takeouts, but the ones that were sitting in those cars at the junkyards, they've been in there for years, and you just don't know what the condition is. I ended up going to AutoZone, getting a remanufactured engine. It cost like $1,150. So I ended up taking the car and the remanufactured engine down to my buddy. He ended up working on it. He pulled apart the remanufactured engine, kept the parts in there, but regasketed, retorqued, and just basically made sure that engine was gonna be foolproof when it went in. What I didn't want to do was pay the labor twice. You know, you hear so many stories about these remanufactured engines being junk, leaking right away, or having problems with the cam or the valves or the lifters or something. He wanted to make sure none of that was going on. I ended up paying $2,850 for him to do all that. Now that included new AC components too, custom lines, hoses and gaskets and everything that he did, not just the removal and the reinstall. I also ended up getting I think $100 back, $150 back on the core for the old engine. I sent that back to AutoZone. All right, first impressions of the drive is the exhaust. First thing I notice, and it's that sound, unique. And it's something I remember from my high school days. My buddy Eric Stang, he had a, a Beretta GT, same exact sound. Uh, getting in, you sit down low. You really do, you plop into this car. The steering is fairly heavy. It must be a GM thing, because the, the Caprice Classic is the same way. There's a lot of weight to the steering. Now, when you're when you're cruising down the road, everything's fine. Uh, it's, it's light and responsive. It's actually a quick ratio steering box that goes into these internationals. But when you stop and you're in the parking lot maneuvers, I mean, you really do, you should have two hands on the wheel, really. It's not as light and effortless as, say, like a luxury car, like a Lincoln Town car. The rear view mirror is like literally like maybe a foot and a half, two feet away from my head. The seating position, I'm having a hard time finding a comfortable spot. Uh, I got plenty of leg room. That's not the problem. It's, it's just the way some of the bolsters are set up is that it just like uh, pushes on you certain ways and I, I'm just struggling to find the right spot for me. That's all. Visibility is unprecedented. 360 degrees, there is no blind spots. The wraparound glass, amazing. Uh, the C pillar, narrow. The A pillar is nearly invisible. Uh, the brakes are pretty good, I'm surprised by that. What I was a little surprised by is the acceleration. It's only 130 horsepower, not a whole lot of weight. I mean, but I, I remember it being a lot more powerful. At least my buddy's Beretta was. And, and maybe it's just being era specific and, and appropriate for the times. Uh, this car was considered like a, a racer. It really was. It was really um, a quick and spirited car at that time in the context of 1988. Today, eh, not so much. Let's just say it's, it's adequate at best. I mean, it's a lot of sound, a lot of RPM, but not a whole lot of oomph. 
to what is surprising about this car, the handling. It does really, really well. It's flatter than I expected. Really, for 1988, this car does very nicely in the handling department. Quick ratio steering, of course, that helps, but it seems to handle pretty flat. You can really toss it around in the curbs. In the parking lot, you can maneuver real quick and easy. It feels smaller and lighter than it really is. It, it handles better than what I expected. So I still have plenty more things to do with this car. The radio pops and crackles from time to time. I get a rattle from the rear suspension. It's in the struts. I gotta replace them at some time. Uh, the transmission clunks when I put it in the reverse. So yeah, there's still plenty more things to do with this car, but for the time being, I'm enjoying it. It's looking good, it's driving pretty good, and I'm surprised by the number of looks I get from it too. Apparently some other people appreciate this car too. Now, this is also a lesson on how to spend six grand on probably a $4,000 car. I mean, I don't know if it's gonna be worth that much, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Definitely I'm upside down on it, but I'm thrilled to be able to get this thing back on the road, get this driving looking good, and uh, and I'm happy to do it. So I hope you're happy with the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed making it. I enjoy sharing these things with you, uh, bringing them back to life and uh, getting them back on the road again. And uh, as always, I guess I'll just see you on the next video. Mm -hmm.